Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you. If you haven't met me yet or if I haven't met you, I'm John. I'm the worship pastor here. And it's awesome to be here and being able to share with you as we continue our series on strong families. And I I know that that song had a mixed reaction because I was looking out there and some people were like, and other people were like, this is awesome. But just so you know, that's a big chunk of my childhood. So be careful how much you diss it. Uh, But anyway, uh, have you ever just sat or maybe laid in bed and just listened to the sound of a clock ticking? Just listen to it. You know, if it's working correctly, it's, it's delivering a consistent ticking sound. Once per second, clear and constant. Time is always on the move. It never speeds up. It never slows down. And every one of us gets a finite amount to work with. Now, when I was young, uh, I don't know if any of you did this, but I would go outside in our backyard and I would hit baseballs for what seemed like hours. That was the thing I did. Uh, I would go out and hit baseballs and hit baseballs and it seemed like time was standing still. Like summer would just last forever, which it didn't, but it felt that way. But as I've gotten older, it seems like the clock might be missing a few numbers. Somehow two o'clock becomes four o'clock becomes six o'clock. Somehow the calendar is missing a month. Where did August go? Does anyone know where August is? Because it didn't happen, I don't think. Time is our most valuable commodity because all of that feeling of time is speeding up is an illusion. It's an illusion. And it's because the more we use time and and the more we get older, we realize there's less time left and we invest it into things that really matter. It becomes more and more precious. And every tick of that clock signals another opportunity that's coming and going every second. In Psalm 90, verse 12, David says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So even biblically speaking, using your days is a sign of wisdom. But how should we budget our time? Now, I believe that there's three main areas where we should focus our time investment. I believe that there's three things that will trump all others and that will be the most important uh, decisions and investments of time in your life three of them. But before we get into them, uh, you know, I want you to have a question in your mind as you judge activities that you're thinking about participating in. And if you're on the fence about whether or not you should do something, I want you to run this question through that scenario. I want you to ask, why am I doing what I am doing? It's a very simple question. Why am I doing what I am doing? It sounds simple, but uh, it's easy to just start doing something because it's the routine. You're doing the routine because it's the routine. You don't worry about the why. Uh, And sometimes things that seem super important to us actually really aren't in where we want to go in life. And things that we feel uh, aren't important at all actually are very important. Now, I often sit down and I uh, sit down at night sometimes with Khalees, uh, my daughter, and and we play. And and this is one of her toys. I call this the epic pink bus because it is epic, and it's really cool. I mean, it lights up, it makes sounds, the people talk. The, as the bus rolls, the people move around, and they, they spin and they shake, and she loves this thing. She'll play with it for a long time. And uh, Now, when I say this, that we play with this bus, probably not many of you are out there thinking, huh, Khalees and John waste a lot of time. Why aren't they figuring out world hunger? Why aren't they helping people in poverty? Why aren't they on those topics? I mean, playing with the pink bus is a huge waste of time. Most of you aren't thinking that. And if you're parents, you really aren't thinking of that because you know that this isn't a time investment that's valuable, that there's value spending time with your kids and playing with them. But what if instead I took this epic pink bus and I sat down all by myself and I played with it and I listened to the bus song and I rolled it and had a great time. Would your perspective change of me? Now, I'm already crazy and you all know that, so that may not change. But would your perspective of that activity change? And if so, why? I mean, the buzz hasn't changed. I'm still the same person. And and the scenario isn't any different. But what has changed? The why has changed. See, the whole point of playing with the bus isn't so that I learn epic bus sounds and can mimic the bus song. It's not so that I find enjoyment in it or learn how to play with the bus. The whole point was to create memories with Khalees. And we all understand this. The point was so that she would know that her dad cares enough about her to spend his most precious resource on her. The why, not the what, determines the value of your time investments. So now that you understand that, now that you've got that, Let's see how scripture tells us to invest our time. I think there's three areas, as I mentioned before. 
Firstly, and most importantly, scripture is crystal clear on this. God tells us to invest in the kingdom that he is building. Invest in the kingdom that he is building. Anything that you invest in here on earth, anything, will turn to dust. But anything you invest in for the sake of Christ, any time you put into the kingdom of Christ will outlive you. It will. Jesus says in Matthew, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now I need everyone here to understand this perfectly. I need everyone to really get this clear in their minds. I want everyone in this room to have nice things. In fact, I would love for all of you to have great vacations. If I could, I would send everyone that can hear me on a two-week cruise to Hawaii. Doesn't that sound nice? I would go with you. I mean, I think that'd be fun. Unfortunately, I have to buy diapers, so no cruise. Sorry. But if I could, I would do that. See, the, the point of this verse here, that, 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 that's what's being said, is that uh, the, the, the material things aren't the problem, that we shouldn't have a feeling like we need to live in poverty or that we need to dedicate our every spare second to the soup kitchen. The, the point is that we need to have a God-inspired understanding of how to invest our time and our resources. See, the scrapyards of the world are littered with things that humans built to last forever. Things that they thought were worth putting their utmost time in. The Titanic was called the unsinkable ship. The CD-ROM, they, were gonna, they said that that was going to be an unbreakable piece of plastic and that it would replace all media forever. And the walls of Jericho were said to be impregnable. No one would ever, ever conquer that fortress. The walls were too thick. You know, the, the Titanic is rusting. The CD-ROMs are shattering and being replaced. And the walls of Jericho are a distant memory. But Jesus, who died and rose again is still active and changing lives and his word still matters and it's still relevant. We are still talking about him, still listening to things about him because only the one who created time is worth putting our time into in the long run. So again, just so we're clear, please enjoy whatever God has given you in this life. It shouldn't come with guilt. You should be okay with enjoying it. But when it becomes the seed of your passion, when it becomes the one thing you seek with all your time and all your energy, it will start to just suck up your life. And you'll get to the end and wonder why you did it. So if you've been at LifePoint for some time, uh, many of you have, uh, you would know that we often will share a message here and there about tithing. And we say that tithing is giving the first 10% of your income to God, giving of your finances to him to support his work. But it got me to thinking, and I had a professor that, uh, at LBC many, many years ago that, that, that kind of jogged this th sort of thinking. What if we gave God... 10% of our time. What if we tithed our time? Now, I think about this and I'm pretty analytical and, and I thought, you know, what if every week I said, God, I'm going to give you 16.8 hours of my week. And then it hit me just how long and how much of my week and my free time 16.8 hours is. And I thought, that's a lot of time. And uh, it really, even in full-time ministry, I thought, I don't know if I can do that. But what happens if we would? What happens if we do? And better yet, what if we thought of that time differently? What if we thought about it as taking that time and injecting it into other areas of our life? What if we thought about how when we make a daily Facebook post, we, we somehow tie an encouragement in to those around us rather than just bashing whatever happens to be coming up and is topical? What happens if we decide that we're going to invest in a coworker that just drives us insane and we don't really like him that much, but we're going to tell him that he has a future and that there's hope? What if we do that? What if your uh, daily routine is all about thinking about how we can bring God with us into the things we do? See, seconds, seconds are ticking. Opportunities are going very fast. Opportunities to invest in the kingdom. They're passing by in front of us all the time. The time that you are spending right now, the time you are spending here at LifePoint is like training camp for investing the rest of your time. Because when you take what you learn, when you take what you hear, when you take what you've grown through and you take that and you share that with the world, that is the intention. 
So when you start your life groups, when you start and grow ministries, when you volunteer, when you, when you take this and you, you share with your coworkers, when you cheer up your neighbors, when you're willing to learn from and mentor the younger generation, when you're willing to share with, encourage, comfort the older generation, when you're willing to stop seeing race as a barrier to how far the kingdom can reach, and when you're ready to start seeing the kingdom of God as an investment, the world will change in your efforts will outlive you. That's an investment in the kingdom. In the book of Philippians, Paul says, more than that, I count all things to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now Paul here is saying that there is nothing at all that is on the same plane of value as investing time into the kingdom. There is nothing, no thing you can possess that it is valuable as the kingdom of God and the knowledge of Christ. So no matter how good of a kingdom I can imagine here on earth where the Cowboys win the Super Bowl every year, no matter how good of a kingdom I can imagine for myself and what I could own and what I could have and what I could do, the kingdom of God will always be better. No matter how good I take care of my body and I preserve my life and I, I eat right and I exercise, no matter how much of that I do, the kingdom of God is still going to last longer. That's why I want to invest in that because it will long outlive me. I want to pay attention to how I'm investing my time. Jim Elliott is a missionary and he was famous for saying, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to be a fool. I don't get to keep my time. I know that. I want to invest it in something timeless. Now, the second major area that I feel like we should invest our time in is our work or our profession. And many people don't like this one at all. You're already like, oh boy. In fact, you might be sitting out there and thinking, if I could just win the lottery, could we just do away with this one? I mean, I don't really want to spend time on it anyway. I could spend time relaxing. I could spend time doing this or that. And the reason that we all think that way is because we've associated work with something negative right away. As soon as you say work, it's negative. And many of us are working in that kind of job or, or working that sort of position right now where we just think that work is negative. And it may not even be the actual thing you do, the process that you do for your job or for your profession or your hobby. It may not be the, the actual process. It might be the environment you have to do it in, the coworkers you have to do it with. It may be a lot of things. But it's important that if you are in that predicament of not liking your job, that you understand that the work in itself, the work is not the enemy. The work isn't the enemy. See, I believe that God has put in us a desire to work. Maybe not to do the job you're doing right now, but to do something with your time, to accomplish something with your life. Build, create, raise children, do all sorts of things. Contribute to a common effort in some area to bring about something good, to bring something better to life. I believe that that can drive us so when we close the sale, when we, when we figure out how to make a contract work, when we uh, are raising our children and they learn their times tables, when, when, they, uh, when we see something broken and we can fix it, when we see something dirty and we can clean it, there is a small sense of pride in that work. There's a sense of satisfaction. And even if you're sitting out there this morning, because I know some of us are doing this, but even if you're sitting out there and you're thinking, man, what I'd really like to do right now is go burn the building I work in down and then dance and laugh in the ashes. That's what I'd really like to do. But even if that is what you're thinking right now, I think that even you, whoever you are, would find some sense of satisfaction when you take that paycheck home. And now you can buy something for your wife or for your kids, or you can provide housing or food. There has got to be at least a small sense of satisfaction. So even if you're sitting here and thinking there's no pride in what you do, remember this. The point here is that time and work, work is only worth the time you put into it when you think of it as an investment. When you think of work as an investment. 
See, you are investing in a profession and maybe it's because you want to make something better than it was. Maybe you're trading time for money because you want to have a certain uh, uh, level of living. You are interested in investing your time into work because it brings meaning to your life, to your work, to those you work for or work with. And maybe it's just because people are depending on you at home. But there is an investment that's worth it. The Bible is also clear that work is part of life and it will require a time investment. It says in Thessalonians, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now, does your family like to eat? I like to eat. So even in scripture, if you were able, the best way to put food on your table was to work. Proverbs 14.23 adds that hard work brings profit, but mere talk brings poverty. So if you really want to make a difference in your life, and if you really want to make a difference in your family and in your community, put in the hard, dedicated work that God has put in front of you. If you are a stay-at-home mom or dad, make it the best home you can possibly make it. Invest in your kids. If you are uh, an engineer, build the best systems that you possibly can. Build them so that they'll stand the test of time. Uh, if you are, if you are a, a chemist, make the best formulas you can. If you're a janitor, make things the cleanest thing that you can make it. Make it a great environment for someone. Whatever you're doing, do it to the best of your ability. Invest the time, invest the energy. See, the people in the world, there's, the world's full of people who are doing a good job. It really is. There's a lot of people that you would say they're doing a good job. And that makes it the perfect opportunity for you to do a great job. And when you start doing that, when you put in the time, people will know you not just for what you do, but for who you are because you put in quality work. And maybe the next promotion comes to you. And maybe the next lateral shift comes to you. Maybe the next opportunity comes to you because of who you are and how much work you put in. Now, finally, the third area is probably the trickiest. And it's not because it's hard work. It's not because it's work you don't want to do. It's not because it's something you don't want to invest your time in. It's because it's forgotten. See, often we get the ministry piece right. And often we get the work thing right. But this third one matters. We need to invest time into our families. See, we might be doing a killer job at work. We might be churning at hours and, and improving products and doing all kinds of great things. But we go home and we fight with our spouse or we, or we don't have time for our kids. We might be uh, nailing ministry and our ministry is growing and, and we're investing in the kingdom and people like us and, and all these things are going well. And we think we're getting it right. But see, if you get the work part right and you get the ministry part right, but you get the family part wrong, you get all three wrong. You get all three wrong. First Timothy 5.8 says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is strong wordage there. Worse than an unbeliever. This means that if you want to really invest in the kingdom of God, if you really want to make a difference in the world, you need to invest in your family because hopefully your family is part of the kingdom of God. They're part of it. In fact, they're crucial to the success of your job. They are crucial to the real success of your ministry, to finding satisfaction in what you do. And if you are think that you are getting the rest right, but getting that wrong, you're getting them all wrong. Every few years, I personally find the need to rebalance my life. See, full-time ministry is extremely demanding and uh, it's rarely consistent. In fact, it's never consistent. In fact, the only consistent thing, as you may have heard before, is change. My job is always changing. So the work-life balance that I worked really hard to create in 2015 for myself and my family, that doesn't work anymore today. I have to reevaluate how am I spending my time and why am I doing what I am doing? And it needs to be tweaked and adjusted at regular interval, intervals along the journey. And last year, I noticed that a major part of my life and work balance was tilted. My time investments were out of balance. See, over the years, nearly every ministry here at LifePoint has been growing, and that's awesome. And as someone who's involved in several areas of ministry here at LifePoint, 
nearly every ministry I was involved in was growing as well. And it was getting more complicated and it was getting more volunteers and, and the number of ministries that were branching off of ministries that I was leading was increasing. And uh, I was working with a lot of different leaders and, and it's all fantastic. I love being a part of a growing church that has energy and that wants to make an impact on Harrisburg. I love it. I really do. It's what makes me tick. I love it. But for me, it was also a little bit crazy. It was starting to get crazy. I was trying to figure out who was in charge of all these ministries and I realized that people thought it was me. And I really responded to this by thinking, I'm going to pour myself into fixing this. So I started organizing teams and, and I started raising up leaders and I, and I discipled as many as I could and, and I created meetings and I created more meetings. And then I actually did this. I created a meeting about when to have more meetings. I did do that. And what happened was it just continued to get more and more complex, but I was starting to get a handle on it. I was starting to get caught up. And then two things happened to me that realized I had it all wrong. Two things happened. The first one was I came home after one of the 10,000 meetings in a week, and uh, it was like 10 o'clock, and I sat on the edge of the bed. And Janelle said, are you there? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I've told you something three times. And I'd love to tell you this morning that I was absorbed in the news or that I was just reading something on the iPad or I was doing something like that. I was staring at the wall and I had been for three minutes. And a lot of times that kind of stuff happens and we chalk it up and we say, you know, eh, John just had a rough day. It'll be better tomorrow. And that, there is room for that. And we, we do that a lot. You know, say Janelle had a rough day and it's just what it is. But this had happened before and she didn't tell me about it. And now she was telling me. It had become a pattern. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was over the last two years, God had been telling me uh, in no certain terms, but I had this general inkling that he was wanting me to let go of something in my ministry. Let go of something that was taking my time away. And I couldn't really tell what it was at first, but several years ago, I had started to lead an event. And, and many of you have been to one, and it's called the Night of Worship. It's an awesome event. I love that event. I had started to host that. And uh, it wasn't something that LifePoint came to me that Glenn said, hey, John, we really would want to do this event. Or, or somebody said, we should have this. It was something that I felt a passion for, that I said, hey, the church would benefit. I'll, I'll bite the bullet. I'll lead it. And uh, we'll get this thing going. And I was excited. I was passionate. And I, I poured time into it. It was an awesome event. But much like other events here at LifePoint, it grew. It got more complex. More people started coming. More people got involved. More volunteers got involved. And the first night of worship that we had, it took about 200 hours of my personal time, uh, weekends and things like that, to make that happen. Between programming lights and, and getting media ready and programming music, whatever, 200 hours. And that's doable. You spread that over a year, that's not so big. The next one took 400 hours. And after that, as soon, of, as soon as one year of night of worship would end, I'd take a break for a week, and then I'd start working on the next one. And that became my pattern. And yet, despite that huge time commitment, and despite the chaos and my weekends just being all over the place, I still loved the event. I still loved live, leading it. I still thought it was awesome. I loved the team that was being built around the, the event and how much they contributed. And so when God was telling me to let go of something in my ministry, I was really hoping that I would hear, John, please let go of the paperwork for the song licensing. I mean, you don't need to be doing that. I was like, God, thank you. I've been saying that. That'd be great. And, uh, you know, I really thought maybe he would say, you know, John, maybe you don't need to put as much time into figuring out the budget for 2018. God, I'm there with you. I really don't want to have to deal with that either. But that's not, that's not what he said. See, what God was telling me to let go of was the night of worship. And I can clearly remember that urge from God. I can clearly, I can remember. In fact, I remember the week it happened. But you know what I said to God? I said, no. I did. I said, no. And so I hosted one more night of worship in 2017. I hosted one more. And that event was probably the best one we've ever done. We got a ton of positive feedback. The night was just awesome. We invited the presence of God to come and he filled this place and, and people had a great experience and the, all the positive feedback in the world, every volunteer felt inspired. It was great for everyone except me. 
So after the night of worship last year, I scheduled a meeting with the worship team. And first of all, I thanked them because they dedicated hundreds of hours of their own time. I thanked them for making it a great night and making it a great event and a success for the kingdom of God. I told them then that I wouldn't be leading one in 2018. And I had some tears and there were questions, but uh, I knew and I explained to them that my life had gotten out of balance. My time investments were a chaos and I knew I needed to let this go. And to me, that was a tremendous relief. Not because I was getting out of something I didn't want to do or something that sucked up a lot of time. That wasn't the relief. The relief was I was giving my family the chunk of time that they needed, finally. See, the big thing I needed to do for the kingdom in 2018 was not to host another awesome night of worship. Someone else can do that. That wasn't what I, my investment was supposed to be. I needed to invest time in my family. That was what I was supposed to do for the kingdom in 2018, and I have not regretted that choice. In fact, that was what God had intended the entire time, because I closed the meeting and someone immediately stepped up to lead the night of worship in 2018. She is doing a great job. She has built a great team around her. The night is going to be incredible. Uh, this is my shameless plug, by the way, so if you're writing stuff down, just write down, you know, night of worship, make sure you're there. Um, but it's going to be an awesome event, and uh, I'm really excited to tell you that it will be 100% volunteer and intern driven. 100%. Not a single staff hour will go into that event, and it will be awesome. It could happen without me because that's what God wanted. So be at that. It'll be great, I promise. But all this is to say, please invest in your family it probably will cost you something. I am here today because my mom and dad made an investment in me. See, my dad could have worked a lot of overtime. He had a lot of optional overtime that he said no to, even though we needed money. He said no because he wanted time. And my mom, she stayed home uh, to help us when we were small. And then she went back into the work world and worked jobs she didn't want to do because she helped to raise us, me and my brother. And, uh, you know, Everything that I am, I owe something to them because they invested the thing that was most precious to them in me. So some of you might be out there thinking, but I didn't have that kind of upbringing. I didn't have that growing up. No one invested in me. And this is your moment to invest in your family so that someone else can have this. Invest in your family so that they can be ahead of that. Invest in your spouse now while there's time. See, the beauty of investing in all of these areas is that they aren't separated by thick dividing lines. This isn't a big pie chart where you have your family slice and you have your kingdom slice and you have your work slice. The, the areas bleed into one another. They bleed into one another. So you can bring God with you into your family life and you can bring God into your workplace. Even though they tell you you can't, you can. Because you can encourage your friends. You can encourage your coworkers. There aren't thick lines that divide this stuff. Colossians 3, in fact, says that we should work as if we are working for God, not just an earthly boss. So when we do that, we bring the kingdom of God into our workplace because we're, not, we're working for the boss to make some money and we're working for the boss to, to fulfill our job requirements, but we're working for God. He wants to be pleased with our work and we want him to be pleased with it. We can bring the kingdom into our family time. Next time there's game night, pray with your kids. Tell them about what you do at work. Invest in them. Invest in them and bring the kingdom along. Bottom line to this morning, bottom line, be intentional with how you invest your time. And I'm going to give you a phrase here that I feel should stick with you as you go out, as you try to determine how should I invest my time. Be as careful with your time as you are with your money. So you can always make more money. It may be hard, but you can do it. But you can never, can never add more seconds. Can never make more time. So I'm going to say it again. Be as careful with your time as you are with your money. Studies say that you have to hear something three times to have it really sink in. Be as careful with your time as you are with your money. Next time you write a check, think about your time. 
Next time you balance your checkbooks, think about your time. Next time you visit the bank, think about your time. Because your faith, your family, your workplace, your life will not be the result of which church you went to. It will be the result of how you invested your time, how you invested it in your work, how you invested it in your family, and how you invested it in your kingdom. That will be your legacy. Let's pray. God, you existed before time. Lord, you knew that the struggles we would all be having here in this room as we try to figure out what to do with our time, how it would please you, how it would please our families, and how, Lord, we could find satisfaction in life. Lord, I'm so grateful this morning that you are a God who sees all time, that you've seen lifespans come and go, and Lord, you've seen good decisions and bad decisions. Lord, you can give us advice on how to use our time wisely. But Lord, part of that step is we need to be open with you and be willing to change things. And when we ask that question, why am I doing what I am doing? I really hope that you are somehow in that answer. I really hope that our family is somehow in that answer. I really hope that for some reason, putting in a good work ethic, putting in a good effort is in that answer. Because if it's not, Lord, it may not be worth it. And Lord, the world is so busy running around going to this thing and that thing. I just wonder, is anyone asking that question? Am I asking that question? Lord, I pray that that would be something that challenges our thoughts as we go throughout our week. I pray that we would continually, consistently ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Is it worth it? And I pray, Lord, that we would be very careful with our time, that we would invest it in things that last, that we would see it as a valuable, treasured resource so that when we give it to our child, when we give it to our spouse, when we give it to a father or mother or aunt or uncle, when we give someone our time, we are giving them something precious because we care, because we want to invest. Lord, thank you for your time being here today. Thank you that you come into this place to inspire us, to give us hope. Because Lord, we can get better and we can have a great and awesome life by investing our time well. Encourage us all with that today. In your name, amen.